So please turn with me in your Bibles to the Old Testament. We're turning and looking at the book of Ezra this evening. We are finding ourselves as we're moving through this book together in chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3. We'll be looking at just the first paragraph of this chapter, verses 1 to 6, which in the providence of God in our worship calendar is a fitting preparation to this table this evening as well. Ezra chapter 3. We'll be looking at the first six verses. Ezra 3, verse 1, it is written, When the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the feast of booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings the offerings at the new moon, and at all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made a freewill offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to Him together in prayer. Our Father, we gather this evening by the work of Your Spirit, the fruit of Your grace, that we would be found as one man, one people in Your Son, and as Your church. And Father, we gather together from varying circumstances and situations, each one of us with certain levels of fear in our lives. Father, we know that we are called to fear You alone, and Your heart is so divided with so many other fears. Help Your people, we pray. We know You have brought us together to seek You as we ought in our fears, and we pray that Your Word would continue to address and minister to to us as You already have. We pray for us who hear Your Word, that we would listen carefully, with humility, seeking understanding, And we pray, Father, that the one who expounds your word would be likewise clear and labor to be careful according to your word. We ask this, Father, that you would be glorified in the worship of your church, your temple. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Fear is vital to life. Fear is actually a gift of God. It is necessary, a merciful gift from Him to protect us and to move us away from danger. In fact, the first word that God ever gave to people, to our parents in the garden, had fear involved in it, implied by it, a warning that if we sinned against God, we would surely die. And that warning was intended to provoke a fear in Adam and Eve that they would flee the danger of sin, of turning away from God. Our parents and us have neglected that fear and died. So God has only intensified His warnings in the Bible, and our sin and the curse on this world has only multiplied the occasions for which we have to be afraid. So how we respond to fear, what we do with our fears, in many ways tells us immense amounts about ourselves. It tells us who we are. Just take, for example, uh, since it's that time of, in, our, in our culture, in our nation, the elections. And we often use the phrase, well, I might vote for the lesser of two evils. And essentially what we're saying is that I'm voting against what I'm most afraid of. I fear more the other candidate than the one I support. Or even you think in the church or in Christian groups and organizations, a lot of what is done, the reason for it is given for fear. Fear of leaving, living, as I saw recently in a new conference, fear of living in the so-called, quote, post-Christian culture and what we ought to do because of that. Until the Lord returns, until He fulfills all His promises to us, 
we will live with fear. It is unavoidable. It's necessary. Our question is what do we do with it? How do you respond to fear? And that was the urgent question for the recently returned exiles here in Ezra chapter 3. God had sovereignly kept his promises as we've been looking in the last few weeks, stirring up the king of Persia, Cyrus, to bring back his exiles and bring them back from Babylon, now Persia, back into the land. And God brought him back, but now the land, as you see in verse 1 of chapter 2, as we looked at last time, it is no longer the land of Israel. It is just a province. It's a province of Persia. They're still subjects of another empire. And with all the triumph of God's faithfulness, you know what it was to be back as a, back in the province of Persia? It was scary. It was terrifying. Those returning, they had only known Babylon, Persia, as their home for a couple of generations. The journey was long. They were a long way from what they were familiar with. Though it was the land that belonged to them as God's people, it was not their land, what they had been accustomed to. And it was essentially the wild east of the Persian Empire returning to a broken down land with destroyed cities. They had no military protection. And they had landed opponents. People who, by the way, had been there for 70 years without them and they weren't too excited to have them all come back. And they're starting with, as we looked at last time in the genealogy of chapter 2, if you look at verse 64, they're starting with just a little over 40,000 people. It's really a pathetic minority. It's a small number of people. They're surrounded by much stronger enemies, not to mention the other nations that are around them. But they were there. And as chapter 2 ends, just above chapter 3 and verse 70, they were there in their towns, all Israel in their towns. God had been faithful. He had brought His people back together. He had kept His promises. But God's people, as we read in verse 3 of chapter 3, were still full of fear. Fear was on them. Being back in the land as an exile, it was strange, it was dangerous, and it was overwhelming. So what do you do first? Build a wall? Raise an army? Organize a militia? Verse 2, you build the altar of God. The priority of the people of God was worship. Amidst all these dangers and uncertainty and fears, God's people sought safety in the only place safety is certainly found. God in His worship. And what we see here, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in Ezra chapter 3, this first portion of this chapter, is that the first response of the people of God in the midst of fear is to seek God so that we might have a right understanding of the priority and the place of the worship of God in our lives. That's what we want to look at this evening. And what we want us to observe are three priorities of the worship of God here amongst God's people. Three priorities of worship. In verses 1 and 2, we'll look at rising to worship. Verses 3 and 4, we'll look at the requirements of worship. And then verses 5 and 6, the repeating of truth in worship. Well, let's look first, the first two verses of this chapter, rising to worship. The people of God rose to worship God. Now, we know that this book can be read dryly, but this is not a dry record. God is declaring Himself to us in His Word. And especially as we see here at the beginning of this chapter, the seventh month had come. And at the end of this chapter, or in, the, in our section here, in verse 8, you see it's the second year of their coming to the house of God. This, what we mean, and we put this together, this is the first six months they arose. They had arrived. The bags aren't unpacked yet. They can't pull into the garage. The kids and the parents have no idea where the toys are. That's what's going on. It's crazy. It's chaotic. And yet a decision has to be made because it's the seventh month. The month of Tishri in the Hebrew calendar. For us, it's about September to October. It's the fall. And it is one of the most sacred months on the Jewish calendar. On the first day of this month, it is announced with a blast of trumpets, and it's a day of solemn rest the whole day, the first day of the seventh month. On the tenth day of the seventh month, there is the day of 
of atonement. What we have looked at from this pulpit, what's described in Leviticus chapter 16, when atonement is made, that God may dwell in His people. On the 15th day of this month, it is the beginning of the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. It's when God's people went out camping for a week to remind them of how God had preserved them in the wilderness. And they set up booths or tents and stayed there. In the seventh month, it was commanded in the law that all of Israel was to gather in Jerusalem. Now just think about the excuses that could have been made by these exiles when the seventh month had come. They're excuses we'd understand. When they leave their towns to go up to Jerusalem, there is no guard at their gated community to watch over their stuff. The police were not there. And any authorities that are there are not in their favor, as we will find out in this book. They're an immigrant population, and we all know how people enjoy immigrants in their own land. This is what they're dealing with. And not to mention the fact, as we read the concluding reminder in verse 6, there's not even a temple yet. There's not even a proper place to go worship. So why bother? Certainly they have many providential hindrances, don't they? Legitimate excuses that we would all understand? Verse 1. No, the people gather as one man. The whole people gather together in Jerusalem. And both Jeshua in verse 2 and the governor Zerubbabel, they arise. They arise and lead the people in worship. That verb there, then arose, is the same that we saw in chapter 1 about God rising up Cyrus and bringing up the people of God. And God brought up the leaders of the people. And God stirred His people to be with Him in His place. Even as the Lord had fulfilled His purposes in bringing them back to the land, He stirred them up to go to keep His commands and worship on the seventh month as He decreed in Jerusalem. And the people, we see, verse 1, they gathered. And that's a lot more than just obeying God's command. They had to gather. But it's what obedience to that command meant. God had kept all His people. That long list we looked at last week in chapter 2 of all these people that are now Israel, God brought them together. And they stood together in Jerusalem. A testimony to the faithfulness of their covenant God. To bring them back as one person. And to declare His glory. You can't do that reading Torah in your living room. You can't do that with a small group of people from your same town. You can only do that together as God brings all His people gathering as one, vividly testifying to the unity they have because of Him, the faithfulness of His gracious promises to bring them back, just as He said, and the trust they have in Him. So what do they do first when they gather? There's no temple. (laughs) Well, they had examples. What did Abraham do In Genesis 12, verse 7, when he got to the land and God had been faithful to his promises. What did Moses do in Exodus 17 when he led Israel to have victory over the Amalekites and shown himself victorious? What did David do at the end of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 24, when his sin had let a plague break out among Israel and God had been faithful to restrict it? They had a lot of precedent in their history. What do you do when you're mindful of your sin, when the fact that there's only 40,000 of you who are called the people of God because you had been so idolatrous, and yet when you are mindful of the grace of God, that we're back, Israel still exists, God's promises are not voided, we're here in Jerusalem, when you're mindful of your sin and you're mindful of God's grace, you secure your way to that God. And so verse 2, they build an altar. They build an altar. In danger and distress, you had better be sure you have a way open to the God who graciously keeps His promises. Make sure that's secure. And that's what these offerings they offered in verse 2, the burnt offerings. That's what they intended. Burnt offerings were the most basic offerings in the sacrificial system of Israel. They're described in Leviticus chapter 1, the first chapter. And we read there in verse 4 that 
the offerer was to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. It was an animal that was taken from their flock. And it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. These were the most basic offerings. They were given even as we read in verse 3, morning and evening. It was the daily covering, the daily atonement, the daily covering of your sin. The provision of a holy God to be with His sinful people because the death they deserved had been suffered by another in their place. Morning and evening. God's presence with His people wasn't automatic. Couldn't be assumed or taken for granted. And how could it be? They, they, they've sinned. They don't deserve His presence. They deserve His judgment and anger. Israel deserves to be at this point, wiped off the map like all the other peoples of ancient history. And yet God Himself instituted a way where His just wrath would be given on a life in their place so that they might come to Him. They might be with Him. They might worship Him and have the marvelous privilege of seeking Him even when they're afraid. It's a God to go to. You see, without God's grace by these sacrifices, without trusting as sinners that they could rely on God to remove His anger from them because it's been satisfied on that offering, they couldn't stand before Him at all. They couldn't expect Him to do anything. They'd have more reasons to fear from Him than anyone else. And yet God in His grace opened a way to come to Him by sacrifice. So rising to worship Him was their first priority. If they were to, to know God and they were to know that He was with them in their fears and in their circumstances, the way to Him, to worship Him, had be opened. We often pray a prayer of thanksgiving. It's a very good prayer. God, we thank You for allowing us to worship in safety and freedom. And it's true and it's a, it's a good prayer. Because being able to worship publicly and even putting signs on the building in safety, that's a mercy. But we must realize that we rise to worship whether it's safe or not. Is worship that is dangerous or even in just inconvenient necessary? Well, yeah, your life actually literally depends on it. Your whole life depends on it, on gathering to worship. And unless we think this is just some Old Testament theme, we're reminded, even in the book of Hebrews that was written to Christians who suffered exile, dispossession, and even threatened with death. Do not neglect meeting together is the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And the book of Hebrews chapter 12 will go on in just two chapters later in verse 4 and say, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. You put together the logic of just the book of Hebrews and it, you gather to worship even if your life is in danger. Even if it risks your life. A few years ago, a pastor from the country of Laos where Christianity suffers far more opposition than we do here he gave this message through a visiting American in a missionary bulletin. He said, please pray for my country, Laos. I know how hard life is, but I want to encourage believers in America to be strong in their faith. And then he said something that both shames me, embarrasses me, and calls me to repentance. Repentance. You have the right to read the Bible, to pray, and go to church. Please do it. Now maybe our low ocean brother is just a bit naive. I mean, doesn't he know that we have the Super Bowl and Oscars? Our kids have sporting events. I mean, Saturday was so busy. I, I just need a day, you know, maybe a little afternoon with some Netflix. Do you know how much I have to do on Monday? How can I be expected to come worship God regularly? Do not ever wonder why our brothers and sisters around the world endure so much suffering with joy and why we seem to collapse over relatively small trials. Because too often we excuse ourselves from meeting with the God who meets us with our fears. And they don't. And he is right, isn't he? Life is hard. 
and he's a wise man, and he knows whether you're living in America with all our convenience and comforts and freedoms, or you're there in Laos fighting it out as he is, life is hard. We have a world of adversaries, not the least of which is our own sin, which means that we excel at deceiving ourselves. It's very hard to live when you're your own worst enemy. And so we need God. We need the continual and constant reminder of what these burnt offerings here in Ezra 3 pointed to, that God has put forward Jesus Christ as a propitiation of our sins by His blood to be received by faith, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 3. The constant, continual reminder. That's why our week begins by gathering to worship. If we think we will gain somewhere else or by something else that is just again our own self-deception and the lies of the devil on what we will lose if we do not listen to God's call to rise and worship. Secondly, the second priority we see here beginning at the end of verse 2 and through verse 3, the requirements for worship. The requirements for worship. And what is clear to us as it jumps out to us even through verse 4 is how exceedingly careful Israel was to worship according to the Word of God. God's Word had just been fulfilled in such detail vividly before them as God had kept His promises and, and preserved them and brought them back to the land 70 years when He said He would. And He did. And so notice everything has to be done in verse 2 at the end of the verse as it is written. In verse 4, it was done, the Feast of Booths, as it is written. And even the end of verse 4, everything was offered according to the rule, as each day required. What God said, what is written, what He required and expected, it was done with diligence. And just in passing, I want to note the comment that I believe Ezra is making. Ezra is writing this in verse 2. As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Now, God had given instructions through Moses, and particularly in Exodus 27. And here, Ezra is assuming that all of what we call Torah, or the Pentateuch, the first five books of your Bible, was written by Moses. That's pretty astonishing. When the reigning, dominating theories in our universities and academies today will tell you it is impossible for Moses to have written Torah. It must have been written by many people and compiled after, much after Israel was back from exile in the land. But here we are, six months in the land, and they're reading Moses' words. It's a bit of a problem with that theory, don't you think? Presents an issue. Just note that. We'll move on. Moses was very clear. Moses was clear that there had to be an altar built, and the altar had to be built with unchiseled stones from the field. And there wasn't such an altar there in its place in verse 3. That doesn't mean there wasn't an altar. You see, after the exile, after God had carried the majority of his people off into exile or killed them, the Babylonians left poor in the land. And also the Assyrians resettled others into the land. And and groups had migrated there also. So you had a combination of Jews, other Assyrians, and pagans all mixing together together. And when the altar of the temple had been torn down by the Babylonians, the people made their own. Jump over with me into chapter 4. Let's just look at verse 2. In chapter 4, verse 2, this is the heads of those people that have come to them and said, We have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. We came. We've got sacrifices too. Likely what had happened is that the peoples of the land, this mixed group of people, some with Jewish heritage and all sorts of other religious ideas and worship, had built a pagan altar of dressed stones upon the foundation of Solomon's old altar. On the spot where worship was commanded, there's a defiled and pagan (coughs) altar. An altar that's unacceptable for worship. Do you want to know why, verse 3, they were afraid of the peoples of the lands? Because they were going to have to tear down what they had used for 70 years and call it an abomination. I mean, the native people would love the immigrants doing that. Right? Of course they were afraid. Their altar had to be torn down and they had to be put up one that was according to the law of Moses. Moses. 
as it is written. They had to tear it down and put it, verse 3, in its place. The Hebrew behind that is very vivid. It's, you could even render that as on its bases. It had to be put right where it was torn down and tearing down the pagan altar that had been standing wrongly on that place. And the whole time, the peoples of the land are watching. They're tearing down their tradition, their religious heritage, what their, what their parents had taught them, their assumptions because of what God's Word said. So of course, Israel was, was fearful. And this word here for fear is not our typical word for fear in the Bible. When you read fear the Lord in the Old Testament, you could translate that as terror. They're terrified. They're afraid. Terrified of the people in the land. But where did their terror drive them? This next clause, this next phrase is important. Grammar will bring you to God, beloved. So just, just stay with me. For fear was on them. Now many translations, if you're reading the NIV or the New King James, will translate that despite fear that was on them. But that is not the best understanding of the Hebrew conjunction here. The conjunction here, you know, conjunction, junction, what's your function? <laughs> Hooking up words and phrases and clauses. You know, I actually had, you know, a very expensive theological education. And when it comes down to grammar, I remember commercials from when I watched cartoons as a kid. But the conjunction for there is causal, meaning that what is coming, the next phrase and words is explaining the reason why for the first phrase, they set the altar in its place. They built the altar on top of the original bases because they were terrified of the people of the land. And that relationship is important. The ESV, the New American Standard, is right in this rendering. Because they were afraid, they had to do what God said. Because they were terrified of the land. Well, where else are you going to look for safety or protection and deliverance? And how could they expect deliverance from their God if they didn't care what He'd said? God, I want Your will for my life, just not what You've told me what it is. It doesn't make sense. So they, they had to do what He said and their fear drove them to this. What we see going on here is the lesson of God's discipline. The lessons of the exile are coming home. And they're coming home and they're bearing fruit. Israel was exiled because they had forsaken the worship of God according to His Word. They come back now. They're no longer in safety as they were. They're no longer powerful as they were before. They come down as an embattled minority. And they're strong in the Lord and they worship God according to His Word. They learned what Isaiah had taught them, Isaiah 8.20, to the teaching, to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this Word, it is because they have no dawn. They have no hope. Israel learned that we have a dawn in Him, in the Lord. So we listen to His Word we trust Him. Our sufficiency is Him. We lean, on, we lean on Him. We're afraid. We go to Him. We're terrified. We do what He says. If we do what He says, it's going to make Him mad. Well, we do what He says even more. We look to Him. We can only trust Him. Their worship and their faith was not the absence of fear. Their worship is where their fear led them. It led them to the Lord, to the only one who can protect and provide for them. You know, I'm like anyone else. On Sundays, you know, sometimes a, a concert of music I like and some movie clips, it sounds good. It sounds entertaining. It, it sounds easy. I know you think maybe I'm the only one who struggles sometimes with, with coming to, to worship Biblical worship with the church? You should try struggling coming to worship when you're the guy slated to preach. It messes with you a bit. It reminds you why God has required certain things and forbidden others. Why He has regulated and even restricted our worship. And why worship is, even at its most basic, a submission to His, His commands. It's to bless us, not to curse us. 
It's to bless us. God has put down rules in his word and legislated our public worship to hinder us from what will destroy and harm us. What happens when we're left to ourselves? We make golden calves. We, we, we paint idols on the walls of the temple as Israel did before the exile, and it's all torn down, and God leaves. We worship how only God commands because we can only trust God to tell us who He is and how we are to worship Him. Historically, this is called the, the regulative principle. I know when you hear that, it sounds very un worshipy. Sounds so binding and restricting. What's required isn't worship about venting myself and expressing myself. No, ourselves, myself, yourself, that's the whole problem. And we need Him to guide us. If you don't like regulative principle, just try the guidance principle. That way He guides us by His Word into knowing who He is. I think often in love what Calvin said on his wonderful treatise on the necessity of reforming the church. Such is the folly of our hearts that when we are left at liberty, all we can do is go astray. When we're left to ourselves, all we do is the wrong thing. That's our tendency. And all the Bible and all our experience and all human history just proves it and validates it. And when our worship goes astray, what goes with it? Our knowledge of God. He is declaring to us who He is in His worship. And when the point of worship becomes self-expression or my creativity, my knowledge of God is built, is built on myself. And when I'm afraid, and when I'm anxious, and when I'm going through difficulty... You know the last person I need to learn from is me. I'm an uncertain foundation in those days. God gave us His worship and even restricted and required it to bless us. And we will see the blessing of it pour over among His people here. How were they able to stand against their fears? And even as we will look at in chapter 4, and they are to stand against the essentially the pagans of their day, and asking them to be involved wrongly in worship. Where did their courage and their faith come from? It came from knowing the God who has revealed Himself in what is written, who's revealed Himself in what is required, according to the rule. True worship is about true knowledge of the true God, and nothing is more important. Thirdly, and finally, as we look at the end of this paragraph, we see the repetition of truth in worship. Repeating truth. When we jump to verse 4, we're actually moving forward to the 15th day of this month. The beginning of the Feast of Booths. And it was a fitting celebration in God's providence to bring them together. The Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, when all of God's people went camping. Because for 40 years they were in the wilderness and He led them in their precarious and dangerous existence in that wilderness against enemies and in tents. And he preserved them. And he was faithful. And so annually, God's people to remember through this ordinance, this sort of camping ordinance, this week of the wilderness reminder, as one writer said, wilderness reminder week. They were to remind them of their wilderness journey out of Egypt and into the promised land and how God had faithfully kept them when they were at their most precarious, their most dangerous position. Kind of an appropriate feast, don't you think? When you have come back to the land, and there's enemies all around, and you're afraid of them? It was an elaborate ritual. Numbers 29 gives almost 30 verses describing the Feast of Booths, and it goes on even in Numbers 29, and that's likely what Ezra is reminding us here. They offer daily burnt offerings, they offered offerings at the beginning of the month, verse 5, that's the new moon, and all the other appointed feasts of the Lord. What is being driven home is they did what God's Word said. They did all the feasts, all the commands, all the ordinances, all the principles, worshiping God as He had led them, what He had given them. God's people are back and the worship is on and is repeated and regular. Even 
free will offerings, end of verse 5. Those were the offerings you gave of, of your own free will, when you wanted, when you wanted to praise God, when you wanted to give thanks to Him, and you would bring Him an offering. In the midst of their situation of terror and intimidation and fear, the people of God are overwhelming with thankfulness, giving thanks and coming up to worship Him and to adore Him. And they have, verse 6, they have no temple, they have no walls, but they have God, the God who keeps His promises, the God who is with them and is faithful to His people. And that's what they learned, that's what they rehearsed, that's what they repeated and reminded themselves of in his worship. Why are we gathering again to hear the same things we already know? Will one church service change your life? Maybe. Likely not. That's something you realize as a preacher starting out, you keep waiting for revival to break out out of this sermon, and and it never does. (laughs) At least not yet. And you realize, well, well, God works a little differently. Yeah, no, one service will likely not change your life. But you know what two decades of weekly worship will do to a person? Make them completely new. Completely different. And you may not remember any of the letters or the outlines with which I've alliterated any of my sermons. And you're completely different. Because the repetition and the renewal of the truth is how God renews His people. It's how He changes His people. What is God doing with with repetitious worship? He's building a worldview in your mind. He's building truth in your mind. He's he's reframing your synapses and how you think about life and Him and everything. And He's changing and altering it. The Feast of Booths wasn't just a history lesson. Let's all go camping because, you know, our great, 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 whatever, uh, Israel, they, they went camping in the wilderness. And it was a reminder that your life is fragile. You are fragile. There are many enemies. There are many ways that you can cease and you rely only upon the God who preserved your forefathers and brought you into this land. It's building a worldview. You're sitting in that tent and you're reminded God keeps His people. God protects His people. God leads His people. How important is that when you're in a minority of a land that does not want you there? God keeps His people. He's building a worldview. They were never to forget how uncertain and insecure their lives were except in Him. Him sustaining them. And remember, the God who led that generation led them too. He was the same yesterday, today, and forever. It was Him who was leading them. He would preserve them. He would give them life. And so when they were afraid, they could go, they could go to Him in a desolate place with many dangers. And they could trust Him. I turned 37 just this last week. I know some of you thinking that's, well, that's incredibly young. Others of you are wondering, how, how does a pastor so hip as you in, in the latter part of his 30s? <laughs> Wait, Robert and I worked that out. He gets to be the exotic accent pastor. I get to be the hip pastor. So, so we're, you know, that's what we're working on. I've been walking with the Lord for a little over 20 years now. Not as long as many of you. I've learned a couple things, some of them that have surprised me, that I would not have understood even just maybe 10 years ago. That life is mostly about sentences you know. What I've discovered is that when I enter sickness, fatigue, anxiety, pain, suffering, grief, all I can remember are sentences. Just, just sentences. Sentences like we repeated at, at the baptisms this morning. Things that we've heard and we've heard many times and we know. Like we, we have died in Christ and risen in Him. And if we have so died a death as He has died, will surely we not be risen as, as He has risen? That His death and resurrection are our assurance that, that God is our God and we are His. It's the sentences we repeat at this table. 
that he poured out his blood for us, a new covenant for the forgiveness of our sins. And because of his broken body and his spilt blood and his death, we know we are brought to God through him and that, that he is returning again for us. That, that's what we proclaim. It's just, it's just sentences. Beloved, the repetition of the worship of God is the point. The repetition is the point. We need to know over and over and over again the same old orthodoxies, the same old sentences that when we are afraid, we remember them. And our worldview and our life and our mind and our heart is different. The truths that we are tempted to say, well, well I already know that. Or, or on that hard Saturday, that tired day, how, how is this relevant when I'm afraid or anxious or grieving? Well, what do you need to know? Don't you need to know that you have access to God in the Lord Jesus Christ? That He will not, He cannot abandon you because of His covenant with you in His Son, the covenant that is remembered at this table? that your Savior has purchased for you a secure and an eternal inheritance that is hidden for you in heaven where no one can destroy or remove it from you, that it belongs to you. Your future is guaranteed. You will be with Him to forever. That your God is sovereign. He hears your prayers. He brings them to Himself. He cares about your life, even the details. The hair follicles on your head are counted by Him that he is faithful. And though the journey is treacherous, the opponents are many, he will bring you to your final destination. It is guaranteed. We don't need special things. We don't need new things. We need the same old truths repeated because we face new fears all the time. In the deepest valleys of your life, there will be nothing as good for your soul as the simplicity and the clarity of biblical worship that has driven home the sentences of truth that you build your life upon every week, every day, in the gathering of God's people. If you don't believe me, wait till you suffer. You will agree. What comes to mind are these sentences. The people of London in World War II lived under a reign of terror from the Nazi Blitzkrieg. And in Westminster Chapel one Lord's Day, that's where Martin Lloyd-Jones, the doctor, ministered, he was actually in the middle of public prayer in their service, pastoral prayer, when a bomb exploded literally across the street from the chapel where they were meeting. The sound, as you can imagine, was deafening. The windows rattled, plaster was falling everywhere from the fallout of this blast. What would Martin Lloyd-Jones do? He obviously paused a bit. It would be impossible not to in his prayer. And then he continued to pray. And he finished the prayer. And after the prayer, the deacon came up who gave the announcements before they commenced with the sermon. He gave the announcements. And then he turned around, and Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was, he was covered with plaster. And so the deacon dusted him off. And he sat down, and Martin Lloyd-Jones got up, and he preached a sermon. What do you do when you're afraid? You get a deacon to dust you off. <laughs> and you worship God. And you go to him. Not in spite of your fears, but because of them. And because you go to the God through his Son who is with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless you for your love and mercy to us. It is impossible for us to recount your blessings, to number them. They're beyond our capacity. How faithful and kind you are. Your steadfast love endures forever, and we thank you and praise you 
as we have testimony and bear testimony of your steadfast love in our lives and bringing us to you. Our Father, we pray if there are any here this evening who are afraid without the knowledge of you to turn to, that you would even use their fears by your Spirit and convict them of their need to come to your Son and be brought to you by the forgiveness of sins through faith in Him. And our Father, we pray that you would bring all of us here because of our fears and remembering we come to you who has opened a way to yourself in Christ, that we might stand before you and come to you without fear of you or your judgment and know you hear us. We love you, God. Be with us, we pray, as we continue our worship. In Jesus' name, amen.